Hey guys, it's Sarah with Hearth Home Designs. If you're anything like me, you have at least one friend, family member, or maybe even yourself that is obsessed with the TV show Friends. If that's the case, I have the perfect item for your next project. That is the iconic back of the door frame from the show. Let's take a look and see how I made it. Make life easy on yourself and start by Googling Friends Frame SVG, and you'll have a handful of usable images that'll come up. I selected the cleanest black and white version that I could find and saved it. For the tracing step, I use Corel Draw, just because it's a fairly intuitive and easy to use program. The trace feature is literally one button called Quick Trace. That being said, Corel Draw is a program that I had to pay for. The same function can be found in Inkscape, which is free to use. Even if you've previously set up your job information in Carbide Create, it never hurts to double check your settings. To get the most accurate stock thickness, I measure my material using calipers. Personally, I prefer setting my grid spacing to a half an inch. That way it's easier to get a general idea of the size while programming. Import the SVG that you previously created. When using the quick trace feature, it will automatically create a border around the image itself. So that's what you see me deleting here. Make sure to group your image items together. That way you won't lose any pieces while you're scaling or moving the image around. In order to create the details, I'll be using Carbide's bit number 302, which is a 60 degree V bit. Select the image details, not the borders, and create a V carve toolpath. Carbide has done a great job of importing all of their bits and bit information into a tool library, sorted by machine, then material, and then even the bit type. Whoa, 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 time out. Do not make the same careless mistake that I just made. You wanna click the inside border and then the outside border. Since the order that you click is actually how Carbide Create generates your toolpaths. Carry on. Since I'm using a thicker material with less cutout detail, I'll be selecting Carbide's bit number 201, which is a quarter inch end mill to cut out the center and the frame itself. Something important to pay attention to is the offset direction. Because I want to cut around the detail that was previously created, I selected the outside right option. You can see how the different options could affect the toolpath. Take a look at the blue line that goes from the inside of the border when inside left is selected to the outside of the border when outside right offset direction is selected. Make sure to create tabs for both the inside and outside of the frame to prevent any material from shifting or jumping while the machine is still running. I like to use Carbide's Toolpath Simulation to check that I've set the appropriate material depth, tabs, and design. Do 
Since Shapeoko's bit setter is a newish accessory that not everyone has, I've decided to save the two different tools into separate G codes. I previously found my X and Y zero, so I used the bit zero to accurately find my material Z. Since it is my first time cutting this design, I decided to set my Z zero three millimeters above ma the material Z that was previously found with the bit zero, just to be safe. One thing to note is that carving and cutting MDF is extremely messy. I removed my dust collection to give you guys a better view of what the carving actually looks like. I liked how the first pass looked, but I wanted more depth. I decided to lower the Z zero by one millimeter and re-ran the job. Like I mentioned before, I saved the two tools into separate G-codes, so I'm using the bit zero to quickly find my job zero. Do you remember how I said that I messed up selecting the cut order? You can see that result here. I stopped the job after the first outside pass, fixed my toolpath, and re-ran the job. Make your life easy and use some form of small handsaw, like a coping saw or even a Dremel to quickly cut through your tabs. Overall, my frame came out pretty clean, so I didn't have to worry about sanding the front or the back, but I did make sure to sand down the tab nubs.
I always recommend to use an air compressor to blow off any dust that may be stuck to your piece or in the grooves after sanding, but before priming and painting. I have such a love-hate relationship with MDF. It's a mess to cut and you have to make sure to not skip the priming step, but the end result is worth the hassle. Do yourself a favor and place your frame somewhere you can rotate it while spraying. That way, you can spray the different grooves without having to worry about touching the wet primer or paint. I used Rust-Oleum's Clean Metal Primer here. I know it sounds silly and like it's an obvious piece of information, but make sure to read the instructions on the can before starting. This one allows recoating within a few minutes. I let the primer dry overnight before applying the color. I recommend taking the time to do a step that I skipped, which is doing a light sanding over any bumps and drips of the initial priming step, and even adding a second layer of primer. That way you'll end up with a nice, smooth paint finish without any holes or visible pores. I did the paint itself in about four different coats, one on the back, one on the edges, and two on the front, making sure to get inside the grooves and either follow the instructions on a few minutes between light coats or letting the frame dry completely between coats. If you like the plain yellow, this could be a perfect stopping point. I hung up the frame and everything. I kept comparing my frame to the still image and decided that mine needed a bit of antiquing to make it pop a little. Not gonna lie, this next step made me nervous. I sprayed a little rose gold spray paint into a cup and lightly painted that into the grooves. I could have gone a bit heavier with the rose gold for a more defined end result, but I was going for more of a subtle look. The last step is to apply just one more coat of yellow to soften the shadows and let it dry. So that was an easy enough project to make, right? I think so. Why buy one online for 15 up to $40? I'm not even kidding, I saw one for $40. And then having to pay and wait for shipping when you can make your own for about 13 to $14 in material. That's all I have for today, guys. As always, make sure you like, subscribe, and tune in next time. Let me know if you have any questions.